Christian Prayer and Leadership Development Service. Again, you're welcome. This is the King Scott Bible Study, Bible Teaching, Prayer and Leadership Service. Today, we're going to be doing a review of the things we have learned or, you know, uh, talked about in the last four sessions. We've had four sessions already, so today we're going to uh, do a review because on Sunday we will be having a quiz. We'll be having an interactive quiz on Sunday, so we're going to do a review today. I want to ask everybody to go ahead and please mute yourself, mute your phones. You can still hear me. You can still see me for those who, are, uh, who have uh, devices that can let you see video. Uh, so, but go ahead and mute yourself so that you don't interfere with the you know, recording and with the, uh, the broadcast. Let us pray. Father, we give you praise. Eternal God, we worship you. We reverence you. <clears throat> we give you honor. We give you adoration. We give you praise for you are worthy. There is none like you. Thank you for all that you have put in place to redeem us, to bring us back to yourself. We are grateful. And even as we learn these lessons, Holy Spirit, we yield ourselves to you. You are the teacher. Come teach us, guide us into all truth, unveil truth to us. Let the light of revelation flood our hearts that we might understand those things and know those things that have been freely given to us by our heavenly father. And also that we might begin to take advantage of them and begin to walk in them to the glory and praise of his holy name. And we say amen and amen and amen. Again, good evening. You're welcome to the service. Again, this is the King Scott Bible Teaching, Prayer, and Leadership Development Service. All right. So in the last four <clears throat> Wednesdays, we've been looking at the subject of the gospel according to the book of Acts. And we've done four sessions already. So today we're going to do a review of those four sessions of the things we've, the highlights of the things we've learned so far, we've talked about so far. On Sunday, we will be having an interactive quiz and I'm gonna say, get yourself ready for that. Have your notepad, your journal, you know, as the questions are asked, give your answers. And then when, when we give the answers, you cross check to know if you already know them. And the, 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 the need for that, the, the, the reason we do that is to make sure that the word of God is internalized. We don't just want to hear and become forgetful hearers like the book of James talks about, but we want to be those who are doers of the word. Doers of the word must be first and foremost those who internalize the word of God. So again, this is a review. Let's go. So we started off by discussing what should be the appropriate description for the book, <clears throat> the book of Acts. And we started off this series by discussing what should be the appropriate description for the book. Although popularly described as the Acts of the Apostles, if you look at your Bible, that's what you're going to see when you go to the book of Acts. You're going to find the description at the beginning. It says the Acts of the Apostles. All right, but we argued or we, we, we began to discuss that questioning the veracity or questioning the authenticity of that statement. I mean, is it really the, the acts of the apostles or something else? And we established that a more appropriate description is acts of the Holy Spirit. Acts of the Holy Spirit. And this is very important that we as God's people begin to take note of that even though the, 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 what you have in your, in, in your Bible says Acts of the Apostles, in reality, it is a book about Acts of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, in our local house, we now have a new phrase, or a new, we've coined a new term, which we call Acts of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, the moves of the Holy Spirit. You know, so, so that has become a known phrase in our local house. Now, we based this assertion on what I call internal sources or what is known as internal sources. So we got the idea or we got the notion, and as a matter of fact, the assertion that the book is supposed to be called the Acts of the Apostles. We got that from what is known as internal sources. Now, what is internal sources? Internal sources is about what the book or what the Bible says about itself or what the text says about itself or the context or the content, all right? So 
And let me just throw this out. That is a very good way to understand biblical text. You want to interpret biblical text. One of the, probably the best way to do it is to go with internal sources. Uh, let, the, let the text speak for itself. Let the book speak for itself. Let the Bible speak for itself. Let the word of God speak for itself. There is a known danger in preaching, general preaching. Not, not too much with teaching, although teaching also ha, you know, presents this danger as well, but more so with preaching, the preaching of the word. You know, there is a danger that comes in preaching when human, when, when the preacher inserts their own personal context into biblical text without first establishing the original context based on the internal sources. So a lot of times preachers preach from, you know, some biblical text, but they're very quick to insert their own understanding, insert their own interpretation, insert their own context. And sometimes some people insert their personal experiences. Now, thank God for your experiences, but your experience is not, thus says the Lord. Your experience is not the infallible word of God. Your experience does not necessarily have to be other people's experiences. But then the word of God is universal. The word of God is proven. The word of God is tested and tried. Uh, uh, in, in, I believe it's in the Psalmist. It tells us that the Lord tries his word seven times, like silver is purified in fire. So he purifies his word. So he tries his word. So the word of God becomes the, the, the standard for all of us, but it must be indeed the word of God, not the word of man. I'm not going to go into details on that, but what I'm trying to say is that when we don't let scriptures speak for themselves or interpret themselves, then we run into the problem of misinterpreting or misunderstanding biblical text. Scripture is its own interpreter. Let the text and the context speak for itself. I'm speaking to ministers. I'm speaking to Bible students. I'm speaking to those who are going to, at some point, if not already doing, find themselves in a position to teach others. So let the text and the context speak for itself. When, don't just pick a verse and run with it. Make sure you understand the context. Go some verses up. Go some verses down. <clears throat> in fact, you may need to make references here and there that, you know, to other uh, biblical texts that speak of the same content. And that way you have a better understanding. Establish that first before you now begin to build upon that, maybe to try to make it applicable to modern times, personal experiences, you know, trends, what is going on in society and so on and so forth. But let the text speak for itself first and foremost. So always begin with internal sources. Don't start with external sources. Begin with what can I find within this text? What can I find within the context? What can I find within biblical content that highlights this thing or that speaks about this thing or that explains this subject better? And when we do it that way, we have a better understanding and we save ourselves from you know, trouble of misinterpreting or misappropriating scriptures. All right, so based on internal sources, we could say that the accurate or appropriate description for the book of Acts is Acts of the Holy Spirit, not Acts of the Apostles. And here are some of the internal sources. Number one, the Lord Jesus prophesied about the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus is the greatest authority in scripture. <laughs> the greatest authority, as a matter of fact, one way you want to know about a biblical context or a content or a concept is to find out what Jesus said about it. Did Jesus say anything about it? Now, if Jesus didn't say anything about it, then you want to look at the major authors or major uh, uh, script writers. Actually, the Holy Spirit or God is the, is the original author of the word of God. These people who wrote it were just script writers. They scripted it because the Bible says the holy men of God wrote as they were moved by the Spirit. So the Spirit is the author, or God is the author, but they, they wrote it down. They scripted it. So you want to find out some of the major 
writers, did they talk about the subject? You know, these are ways to find, you know, talking about internal sources. So we found out from an internal source that the Lord Jesus prophesied about the coming of the Holy Spirit and what he will accomplish when he, when he, when he comes. John 14, 16 to 17, I'm not going to go into it, just write it down. John 14, 16 to 17. John 14 and verse 26. John 15, verse 26 to 27. John 16, verse 7 to 15. The Lord Jesus just kept talking about the Holy Spirit. Oh, I will send him. The Father will send him in my name. When he comes, he will do this. He will do that. He will do that. And then secondly, we also found that the Lord Jesus told his disciples to actually wait for the Holy Spirit. So not only was he making a, a prophetic promise, he actually now began to speak with some measure of certainty to the point of saying, don't even do anything until he has come. Look at that. Jesus Christ prepared the ground for the move of the Holy Spirit. He prepared his disciples for the coming of the Holy Spirit. He told them, don't go anywhere. Don't, after I'm gone, don't do nothing until you have received the Holy Spirit. You will find that in Luke 24 and verse 49. Luke 24 and verse 49. And also Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it said you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So Jesus even said when he comes, he's going to transform, he's going to do something so that you become my witnesses. So Jesus prepared the ground for the coming of the Holy Spirit. But the third thing we also found out again is that the Holy Spirit now actually came just like Jesus promised. And that you find in Acts chapter 2 from verse 1 to 4. Acts chapter 2 from verse 1 to 4. The Holy Spirit came just like Jesus promised. The question then is, when the Holy Spirit came in accordance with the promises of Jesus, came in accordance with the prophecy of Jesus Christ, how do you then ascribe that to the apostles. No, this is the Holy Spirit coming to do a work that the Father had ordained from the very beginning. All right. But after that, we now proceeded on the subject or in, in the series, we proceeded to discuss the writer's opening statement. And we said the opening statement reveals a lot, reveals a lot about why the author or the script writer wrote what he wrote what processes went into the writing and the intended goal for writing. His opening statement revealed all of that. It revealed why he wrote, what processes went into the writing and the intended goal, what he was trying to accomplish. So we found out from his opening statement that the book is a treatise. It's a treatise of our Christian faith. And again, a, a treatise is an is, 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 a, is a strategic discussion, an orderly documentation of facts and principles, and the conclusions arrived at, you know, conclusions arrived at based on those discussions or findings. It's a scholarly work. It is the work of, of a student who is, you know, diving into a subject matter with details, with, 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 with just like a prosecutor will do a case. So it's a treatise. The book is a treatise. It's not your regular book of, you know, I mean, for instance, when you read, say, uh, the song, Song of Solomon, that is a song of, you know, somebody just, uh, you know, uh, although there are biblical uh, 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 pointers to Christ and all of that, but it is about a person, love, romance, and all of that, and how that ties into God's love for us. When you look at some of the other books, it's about kings, what they did, how they ascended the throne, how they reigned during their tenure, what happened, whether they did well or they didn't do well, and so on and so forth. But when you come to the book of Acts, and Luke and Acts, actually, the writer is saying, okay, this is an orderly work. This is a scholarly work. This is a documentation of facts and principles of our faith. I am prosecuting this case. That is why we as gospel people must take it seriously. We must all actually go back 
to the book of Luke and Acts and, and read with the understanding that this is a case for our Christian faith. Especially in this age where you have so many who are trying to tear down the word of God, trying to tear down the Bible. Some have told us the Bible needs to be reviewed. The Bible is irrelevant. It is ridiculous. It is ancient. It has no application with modern realities and blah, blah, blah. But here you have a scholar telling you, no, I prosecuted this case with, you know, all the tools within my reach at the time and set forth an orderly documentation of the facts and principles of this subject matter. We cannot toy with it as God's people, especially as ministers. We must know the basic facts and principles of our faith. Again, you look at Acts chapter 1, from verse 1 to 3, you see that opening statement and everything I just said so far. But also in Luke chapter 1, from verse 1 to 4, he also says a similar thing because it's the same author or same script writer for the two books. The book is a treatise, is a defense for the Christian faith, is a defense for why you are a child of God, is a defense for what Christ did, what the Holy Spirit did, and what is expected of us who are followers of the same faith. Then next, we began to focus on some things that the writer highlighted as important. How do we know they're important? They are there in his opening statement. I mean, your opening statement for a very good writer, your opening statement should, you know, tell the reader what you're about to talk about. The, you know, the major points, the highlights of what you're getting ready to discuss. Then when you get into the body, you begin to flesh them. You're going to put flesh on all of those outlines. You begin to now, you know, you know talk, expound on the things you have already highlighted at the opening statement. So in the opening statement, he outlines a number of things that he considered important. They stood out to him as a scholar. They stood out to him as a student of the word. They stood out to him as one who, who set out to, to, to prosecute this matter, to prosecute this case. And the first one we found out there is that the teachings of Jesus are just as important as his deeds or miracles. A lot of ministries are built based on miracles, signs and wonders, miracles, signs and wonders, miracles, signs and wonders. Wonderful. But then the writer here wants us to know that it is not only the things that Jesus did, but it was also the things that he taught. So his teachings are so important. As a matter of fact, we saw some biblical texts that seem to suggest that his teachings were more important than the deeds themselves. Think about that. Because these were coming from the Lord Jesus himself. He said, I would rather that you listen to what I'm saying. I would rather that you obey my words. I would rather that you follow my teachings. Because if you don't, you'll be like one who is building a house on sinking sand. When the test of life come, it's not going to stand. A lot of Christians fail, fall today because their lives have not been built on the foundation of the teachings of Jesus Christ. The teachings of Jesus Christ are very powerful. I often say this, you know, if you're talking about miracle signs and wonders, nobody saw miracle signs and wonders like the children of Israel in the wilderness. My goodness, every day had one miracle to, to demonstrate. It was like their entire journey in the wilderness itself was a miracle. But did you know they did not pay attention to the teachings? They did not pay attention to the word of God. They did not pay attention to the commandments, the instructions that God gave them through the man Moses. And what was the outcome? They all perished in the wilderness. Could the same happen to us today? Very so, very well so. If we celebrate and focus so much on the miracles and the deeds of Jesus and you know we highlight those we focus on those we build our ministries on those but we don't pay attention on the teachings well we're not we're not solid in our foundation yet we're not solid yet so we found out that the teachings of Jesus Christ must be paid attention to we must pay attention to the teachings of Jesus as a matter of fact this is what separates us from the mixed multitudes Mixed multitudes will always come for the signs, for the wonders, for the miracles. But disciples go a little bit further to pay attention to the teachings of Jesus. And I pray that is our case also. 
The second thing we found that the writer considered important is the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ engaged in his deeds and in his teachings until the day in which he was taken up. And so we now said we also, like Jesus, must engage in Christ-like deeds and teachings until the day we are taken up as well. Now, somebody can say, oh, how does that apply? Very much so. Because when you go back to the day of Jesus, when he walked the earth in his bodily, in his flesh, Jesus experienced a lot of things. Jesus experienced a lot of things. Sometimes some people picked up stones to stone him. And the Bible said he would find a way to escape them. Did that stop him from doing his deeds? No. Did that stop him from teaching the teachings? No. The Pharisees, I mean, did you, did you not know that information was spread out concerning Jesus? We're looking for this man. We're going to kill him when we find him. He is a violator of our rules and our laws. So there was a threat to the life of Jesus, and he knew it. As a matter of fact, one time he told his disciples, let's go to Jerusalem. And they said, what did you say? They tried to kill you there the other day, and you are going back there again? Think about that, child of God. So Jesus faced the same things we face today, probably not to the degree, but, you know, or, or the magnitude we're facing it because, I mean, the world is just getting worse and worse. But from his life, we can see that the circumstances of his life did not change his position, did not change his posture. You say, okay, trends. Well, there were trends also. There were times when people rose up and led many people astray in the day of Jesus. There were times when some people went ahead and began to cast out devils, but they were not following Jesus. So things were happening in society. There was a time when a, a tower fell and, and people died. <laughs> About 18 people died or so. There was a time when the rule of the day or the, the authority of the day, you know, sentenced some people to capital punishment and they were killed. And that was a shock to everybody. That could be like our 9-11 situation where the Twin Towers collapsed. Does that mean we change posture? No, Jesus continued to preach and to do his deeds. Okay, how about Jesus knowing he was getting ready to be taken on the cross or taken to, you know, to be arrested? Did that stop him? No. As a matter of fact, when he rose from the dead, he continued preaching. He's preaching, continued doing his deeds. Remember when he went to them by the riverside and they caught nothing and said, cast your net. Miraculous deeds, but also teaching them. So, whether in life or in death or in resurrection, Jesus did not change his posture. So we also must not allow any circumstance, whether it's personal, whether it's social, social trends, social, you know, thing, things happening in society today, or even global change. None of that should change our posture. We are here to be witnesses. Remember that. Witnesses. Witnesses of what? Jesus Christ, his deeds, his teachings, his deeds, his, that's what we're called. We're not called to witness changing trends. We're not called to change with changing trends. We're called to be witnesses of the, the Lord Jesus Christ, his deeds and his teachings. The next thing we found out that the writer considered very important is the fact that he challenged our previous understanding of the Holy Spirit and his role in our lives and in the agenda of God. When you think about it, a lot of people today of the Christian fold still do not have a good understanding of who the Holy Spirit is. Some people say, oh, he's wind. Some say, oh, he's fire. Some say, oh, he's oil. Some say, oh, he's water. Some say, oh, he's a feeling, the feeling I feel. And then some treat him like he's second class, like he's inferior. Some treat him like he's a messenger, he's the houseboy. Some see him as optional equipment. I can do without him. There are some teachers actually teaching that, that you don't need the Holy Spirit. There are some who even say, oh, the Holy Spirit operated in the day of Jesus and in the day of the apostles of Jesus, but not in our day. There are so many teachings about the Holy Spirit. But the writer shows us here from his opening statement that the Holy Spirit is actually a commander. He's our commander. He's our commander, and as such, our relationship with the Holy Spirit should be redefined from that perspective. So if you're one who used to see the Holy Spirit as second class or inferior, 
You can't do that anymore. He's your commander. If you're one who used to see the Holy Spirit as, you know, uh, 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 some kind of ephemeral reality, you know, it's not real. It's, love. it's, just, it's just a feeling. No, he's a being. He's the spirit of God. The being of himself, as a matter of fact, is more real than you are. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is our commander. <clears throat> he is not optional. For those who preach that you can you can serve God without the Holy Spirit, not true. And there used to be a great, there still is a great teacher of the word of God in you know, some part of the world who taught a particular teaching about, you know, the process of the believer, the, the process the believer undergoes. And for them, it was salvation, sanctification, Holy Spirit baptism, and so on and so forth. But the truth of the matter is that you cannot even be saved without the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit is even in the process of your salvation to begin with. To begin with, he's, then the, he's the one who convicts. Isn't that what Jesus Christ said? He will convict the world of sin of judgment and of righteousness. He's the one who brings conviction. He's the one who takes the word of God and makes it real to us. So the Holy Spirit is actually a part of our salvation. How do you get saved without the Holy Spirit? So that teaching is not correct. The Holy Spirit is integral to everything God is doing. As a matter of fact, you remember he goes all the way back to Genesis chapter one. He was there with God. All right, let's move on. I'm not going to stay on that. The next thing we found that the writer considered very important is the fact that <clears throat> he made a case for why the Lord Jesus is humanity's Messiah. As a matter of fact, we followed the writer. He took us on a journey to show us how that the Lord Jesus is the Messiah for mankind. He is humanity's Messiah. And he prosecuted that case so very well. He used terms well known in his day, which again, for modern uh, theologians, modern uh, Bible students and readers, they may not see the implication of those terms. But in his, if you go back to his time, the time of the, of the writer, they were very, very, very important. They, were, they had a, a great implication to the text. But they showed that not only did Jesus truly die, but he was truly raised from the dead. The phrases are, first and foremost, the phrase in his passion. That is King James Version. In other versions, you see in his suffering or in his death. So there is a pointer. There is a, a drawing of our attention to his suffering. There is a drawing of our attention to his passion. There is a drawing of our attention to his death. And the writer uses that that it is something known in the time. Why? Because the, 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 the manner of treatment that was given to Jesus Christ is one that involves tremendous suffering. Tremendous suffering was inflicted on Jesus by means of a capital punishment known as death by Roman crucifixion. Tremendous suffering was inflicted. And the death by Roman crucifixion was specifically intended to cause tremendous suffering, leading to death. And the writer points to that, calls it in his passion or in his suffering. As a matter of fact, when the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead in his resurrected form, he, he made a reference to his suffering. <laughs> Think about that. This is Jesus resurrected and still talking about suffering. He said, for thus it was written by the prophets that the son of man ought to have suffered. So he, in the, so prophets prophesied that he was going to suffer. Think about that. So it was, it was a major thing that, you know, the suffering that he went through. And we went into details on that, went into some details on that. For those who didn't see our, uh, our fourth session, please go back to our Facebook page or our YouTube page and look for the fourth session, the gospel according to the book of Acts, part four, we dealt with this particular subject in that session. So the writer also used the phrase, many infallible proofs, that is King James. In other versions, you will have unquestionable demonstrations, convincing proofs, or a lot of convincing proof, or convincing evidences. 
You'll find that in some other versions. He used that phrase to affirm the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Why is that necessary? Today, some people are teaching, oh, he never rose. Because remember, uh, when they found that he had risen from the dead and they couldn't account for his body, the leaders paid the, the, the soldiers who guarded the, the tomb and the, the burial site and told them, if, if you are asked, just tell the people that his disciples came by at night and stole his body. And, you know, it's not true. He didn't rise. They came and stole his body. Well, that became popular. That became popular statement then. So some people, some, some uh, students of history allude to that. So they say, oh, he never rose. His disciples stole his body. <clears throat> yeah, but the Bible shows us <laughs> what really happened and how it happened, that he, they were bribed to do that. But then this writer here is telling you infallible, many infallible proofs. In fact, Somewhere else, another writer tells us over 500 people saw him in his resurrected form. How many witnesses do you need? In the amount of two or three witnesses, a word is established. How about 500? How about 500? <clears throat> over 500 saw him in his resurrected form. But not only that, he did so many things. Now, there are some who say, oh, no, okay, it was not a true resurrection. It was an apparition. It was just a ghost you know, floating in space. No, the writer says, no, it's not. it wasn't a ghost. It's a true resurrection. And you must understand as a minister of God and as a Bible student, there's a difference between a ghost and a resurrected person. Please understand that. A ghost is not a resurrected person. A ghost, I mean, I, I, I can't go into whether it's real or not real, but a ghost is, is, is again, like an apparition, non-concrete uh, non, um, non form. Okay, so it's like mist, it's like you see it, but it, you see the form, you see the, the sight, but you can't touch it. It floats, it can go through walls and all of that. <clears throat> but in the case of Jesus, he was solid on the ground. He walked, he ate food, he talked. He even told somebody, put your hand into my hands, feel my sight, so they could feel his body. They saw the nail prints. They could feel him. They could hold him. And then he, he even cooked for them. Think about it. Have you ever thought about a ghost cooking before? <laughs> but Jesus cooked for them. So these are parts of the many infallible proofs that Jesus gave of his resurrection. So he truly resurrected from the dead. Now, all of these things happened in accordance with prophecy. So apart from the fact that they happened, they were prophesied by the prophets of old. They were foretold right from the beginning of the world, the foundations of the earth. Remember Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman, the prophecy about the seed of the woman, and so on and so forth. Moses told them, the Lord God will raise a prophet or a, a, a messenger like myself from amongst your midst. Dave, when you get to David, he will not leave my soul in Sheol. You know, the Lord said to my Lord, see, I mean, so many prophecies. Isaiah 9, unto us a child is born, a son is given. Government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, and so on and so forth. And so prophets kept prophesying, kept speaking about him, kept speaking about him, and everything happened in accordance with prophecy, in accordance with the prophecies that were declared before the time. And these things are the foundations of our faith. As a minister of God, we ought to know them. As a child of God, you ought to know them. This is why the teachings are important. As a Bible student, you ought to know them. As a Bible reader, you ought to know them. When you are asked the questions, you should be able to defend the faith. You should be able to defend these things. And these things happen, and these are the scriptures that point to it. Now, why again was all of this happening in Luke chapter 1 verse 4? That you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. So we're not talking about fables here, child of God. We're not talking about fiction here, saints of God. We're not talking about pigments of somebody's imagination. We're not talking about, you know, fabulated, you know, concocted, stories by people no like you know there's this scholar in the united kingdom going about talking about you know people who had daddy issues that you know most of the bible never happened it's just you know i don't have time to go into that but that's fine people can say whatever they want to say 
But the truth of the matter, and, and for those who are not yet saved, understand that God has done a tremendous thing to show mankind that not only does he care, but he has actually made a way for redemption. He's made a way for salvation. So if one chooses to toy with Jesus, toy with this, this historical fact, you do that to your own detriment. You do that at the expense of your salvation. And a day comes when it becomes so clear, but probably too late. God is doing this so that not only do we know that he cares and loves us, but he's made a way for our redemption, that you may know the certainty of those things which you have been instructed in. So if you go back to the day of the Lord Jesus, when the Lord Jesus used the phrase to his disciples that you'll be witnesses to me, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. When he said that, he actually meant it. He truly meant it. Who is a witness? Somebody who was there when it happened. Somebody who experienced it. You either saw it, you were there, or you experienced it. It happened to you. So these men and women were not just storytellers. They were people who had experiential knowledge of what they were talking about. So our faith can rest on them. But, you know, beyond that, the same Holy Spirit they had, we have today also. So we know that the Holy Spirit becomes a connector between both worlds. The Holy Spirit becomes a connector of the first generation, you know, the early church and today's church. So the Holy Spirit becomes our uh, 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 earnest, our proof, our evidence that these things are truly so, these things truly happen because what he did then, he's doing even now. So these men and women were called to witness something beyond this world, something that you cannot fit into human ideology, something that you cannot fit into boxes, human reasoning. Listen, child of God, minister of God, stop trying to fit into the boxes that people have provided for you. Stop trying to make it make sense to people. It's a mystery. They were called to be witnesses of this powerful, awesome things that we're beyond this planet. And so, child of God, when you preach, stop trying to make sense. Stop trying to, you know, when people open their, they're like, they don't understand. And by the way, let me say this. Don't preach without the Holy Spirit. Again, that's why the Holy Spirit is important. In fact, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, we see a pattern there. The Spirit of God moved first before the word was spoken. The Spirit moved, then God said. The Spirit moved, then God said. The Spirit moved, then God said. So you must let the Spirit move before the word goes forth. So again, ministers who are watching this or listen to this, especially those who are connected with us, if the order of your service is different, I say change it. Create an atmosphere for the Holy Spirit to move before the word goes forth. Create an atmosphere for the Holy Spirit to move. Again, we call it acts of the Holy Spirit. Let the acts of the Holy Spirit be manifested before you even deliver the word of God. Because the word, the Holy Spirit moves or the word goes with the Spirit. Where the Spirit goes, the word goes. Where the Spirit goes, the word goes. The wheel within a wheel of Ezekiel's vision. I'm going to talk about that. So the birth of Jesus up to his ascension makes one bold statement. And what is that? The eternal God walked among men. Ah, child of God. Think about that. Everything about the life of Jesus was a miracle. Everything by miracle, I mean a divine orchestration, divine move of God. Everything about Jesus was God demonstrating himself upon planet Earth. His birth, supernatural. His growth, supernatural. His ministry, supernatural. His words, they said nobody spoke like Jesus. He spoke like one who had authority. What manner of man is this that even the seas, they obey him. He speaks and demons tremble. Everything about Jesus was miraculous, was divinely orchestrated. His death. His resurrection, and finally his ascension. Everything about Jesus. 
And what is that statement that all of that makes? The eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, walked among men, lived among men, came to earth. Why? To make a way for redemption of mankind. So sinner, whatever situation you're going through, you that is finding yourself in one terrible situation or not, or the other, you are not altogether left alone. The, you, your life is not hopeless. Life is not hopeless because there is God and God can reach you where you are if only you can receive him. Here is how Paul stated it. First Timothy chapter 3 from verse 16. First Timothy 3, 16, and this is the King James Version. He said, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. He's a mystery child of God. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels or seen by angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Paul says here, it is without controversy. So Paul was saying, no doubt about it. Well, how could Paul say that? Paul was not even there when Jesus operated, but Paul could say without controversy. Why? Because he saw some who were eyewitnesses, but beyond that, he received the Holy Spirit. He received the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit walked mightily through him. So for us, even though we cannot say we have seen those who were eyewitnesses, but we do have the same Holy Spirit. So these must also be without controversy for us. And think about it, child of God. If there's still a controversy about these things, then you need to build up your faith some more. You need to ask the Holy Spirit to solidify your faith, to make this truth revelation. Because this ought to be revelation, not only for the days we are getting into because the, the world is becoming something else, but also for you to be able to minister to other people. Because if you don't believe what you're preaching, you don't believe the totality of the truth you're declaring, how do you expect those you're declaring to, to, to believe themselves? But I say it must be without controversy so we can withstand in this earth, in this world, no matter what the enemy throws at us. We're going to leave it there and we're going to pray. Father, we give you praise. Thank you, Lord. Oh, eternal Father, thank you for preserving these truths for our generation. Oh, yes, God. Thank you for preserving these truths for our generation. Thank you for your master plan of redemption. Who could have thought of this? Who could have imagined this? Who could have done a better job but you, the all-wise God? Thank you. Although the world stumbles over these things, stumbles over these truths because of rebellion, yet you have given grace to the humble. For the word says he gives grace to the humble, but resist the proud. He knows them from afar. So, Lord, we come with humble hearts. And for those who are humble at heart, who receive this truth and receive the truth of your word with humility, I pray, oh God, that your truth will permeate their hearts. Your truth will permeate their souls. Your truth will come like a rushing water into every layer of their souls. Let them be washed clean, oh God. Let the conviction of the Spirit, that conviction that comes only from the Holy Spirit, come upon them. And we know this conviction doesn't bring depression, rather it causes them to sorrow, godly sorrow. It brings godly sorrow, which leads to repentance, which leads to conversion, which leads to transformation. Oh, God, would present those before you right now who are out there, who are under the sound of my voice, who have not yet received Jesus Christ, who have not come to the saving grace, saving knowledge of Christ. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit will begin to touch them and begin to bring conviction of heart, conviction of soul, conviction of spirit, that they cry out to you for help, cry out to you for salvation. And Lord, your word says for all who call to you will in no wise be neglected. Everyone who calls upon the Lord shall be saved. He who calls upon the Lord shall be saved. As they call upon you, let salvation come to their homes. Let salvation come to their families in the name of Jesus. So Lord, we come into this mystery with humility of heart. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for taking upon yourself the ultimate prize for humanity's redemption. Oh my Lord. Today we talk about it, but you experienced it. You went through it. You bore it all. 
You took those nails into your hands. You took the crown of thorns upon your head. You took that spear to your side. You bore the burden of sin. You endured the worst treatment from godless humans. You took on the rage of the gates of Hades, my God. Satan and his cohorts, Satan and the hordes of hell met you with rage. And you stood between them and humanity. And they poured their venom. They poured their rage on you. But you took it all, Lord Jesus. You took it all, Lord Jesus. All just for us. Thank you. Thank you for going all the way. Thank you for not stopping midway. Thank you for bearing the entire pain, drinking that cup of bitterness, that cup of suffering for our sakes. We are grateful, Lord Jesus. We are grateful. And precious Holy Spirit, please help us to never take for granted or forget the price that was paid for our redemption. For when we forget these things, we begin to live our lives anyhow. When we forget these things, we begin to treat God like he's not good enough for us. When we forget these things, the enemy begins to whisper into our ears as if there's something better out there for us. When we forget these things, then our, our lives and our, and our walk and our journey of faith becomes shipwrecked. But rather, Holy Spirit, may our lives truly bring pleasure to our Heavenly Father. That's our prayer, Lord. That's our prayer, Lord. That's our prayer, O oh Father. Holy Spirit, help us to make it a reality that our lives will indeed bring pleasure to our Heavenly Father. May we become co-laborers with you, O oh Holy Spirit. May we no longer treat you like a second class. May we no longer treat you like you are inferior. May we no longer treat you like you are here to do our bidding. We tell you where to go. We tell you what to do. We decide when we want you and when we don't want you. When you speak to us, we, dis we choose whether we want to listen or we don't want to listen. Away with that. And we are sorry for that, oh Holy Spirit. Now we realize you are in charge, we are not. You are in charge, we are not. It's not about apostles, it's about the Holy Spirit. It's not about prophets, it's about the Holy Spirit. It's not about the fivefold ministry, it's about the Holy Spirit. It's not even about the church, it's about the Holy Spirit. So may we become co-laborers with you, oh Holy Spirit, for kingdom advancement. You lead the way, we we'll follow. You have the best ideas, may we follow your ideas. You have the better technology, may we follow your technology. You have the best wisdom, may we follow your wisdom. You know how to permeate realms of darkness. We don't even know how to do that. So you take the lead, but give us instructions. Give us instructions for life and for godliness. And we promise to follow, to obey. Work in us. Walk through us. Oh, Holy Spirit, work in us and walk through us. Yes, Holy Spirit, walk in us and walk through us. For the glory of our Father. For the name of our champion, Yeshua HaMashiach. Have your way, oh, Holy Spirit. And we say amen and amen and amen. And Lord, we begin to pray for those who are sick in the body. From the crown of the head to the soles of the feet, we declare, Lord, by the stripes of Jesus, healing has been paid for. Healing has been afforded. So we begin to appropriate the healing that Jesus paid for through his stripes. We declare their bodies receive healing. We declare their blood receives healing. We declare their bones receive healing. We declare their vital organs receive healing. We declare their systems receive healing. We declare healing in their mind. We declare healing in their souls, every layer of the soul, even healing in the spirit, broken spirit, crushed spirits, terrified spirits, terrorized spirits. Oh God, that healing comes upon them by the efficacy of the spirit. Be healed in your body. Be healed in your blood. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your mind. Be healed in your relationships. Be healed in your circumstances. Let the light of God shine where you are and cause darkness to give way for the glory of our Father, for the glory of our champion Yeshua in the name of the Lord.
be healed in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you again. We want to appreciate you all for your time. And so Sunday, we're going to have a, a, an interactive quiz and we hope you join us then and uh, have your notes, you know, do it like you are in a real class and then check yourself and see, if, uh, <laughs> see what you scored. All right. So until we come your way again, I want to say God bless you. We love you all and bye-bye. Amen. God bless everyone.